Hi everybody, welcome to our Economic Exchange event um, which we're hosting online today. Um, thanks very much for joining. We've got um, a few more people to join us throughout but we'll, we'll, kick, we'll kick off now because obviously you've all joined us on time um, for those of you here now. So thanks for again joining us today. Um, we're talking about future strategies for youth support organisations today. Um, and with economic exchange events, what we do is, you know, we work with clients every day. Um, we learn about what's important in, in the marketplace. And what we want to do is share that learning with other organizations so they can get some knowledge and insight. And we bring together selected partners to join us. So we've got a partner here today who we'll um, introduce in a moment. Um, so really, we focus on helping nonprofit organizations um, develop their strategies, their tools um, and look also at sources of funding to help them achieve that. So um, today specifically, as I mentioned, we are talking about youth support organisations. We're taking a specific look at how um, you can support young people and volunteers and that might be about young people being volunteers or it might be about um, volunteers supporting young people. Um, and we'll be covering off things around process management, communication methods, impact measurement, system development, and as I mentioned, the sources of funding. So we'll probably be going for just over an hour. Um, these webinars will be recorded and sent out afterwards, so um, you'll have them to reflect back on, um, and we'll also send out the slides. I'm Heather Black, Managing Director of Economic Change, and I've been supporting nonprofits, particularly social enterprises and charities, to develop their strategy and digital solutions um, for measuring impact and delivering what they do for the last 17 years. Um, it's something I'm very passionate about, and I always believe in sharing best practice, which is why we run these events. Um, Sarah Love Brooke is on my team and she has previously worked um, in various youth support organisations. So she's going to be sharing some of her experience um, of when she worked at the Inter International Assistantship Service and also indeed for some of our client projects now around supporting young people as volunteers and adults as volunteers. And we've got Ruth Price, um, Senior Grants Manager from Paul Hamlin Foundation with us as well. So she's going to be talking about the Youth Fund and how it um, supports the capacity and growth of youth organisations. So she'll be sharing some best practice of some of the, the, the clients they've funded um, and also talk about the funding criteria. Um, and alongside that, I appreciate they won't fund absolutely everything. So we, we've also highlighted some other sources of funding um, towards the end of this. If you've got any questions throughout, please do put them in the panel um, um, and we can address them at the relevant bits. So we'll start working through the learning for today. Um, as I mentioned, economic change really does look at a combined offering around social impact measurement, management systems using Salesforce, business strategy, and indeed change management, because quite often all of these things come with a change management element. So we take a structured approach to implementation and support um, around again, measuring impact and developing management systems. So the tips that we're sharing with you today is really about that. And what we believe is excellence in impact measurement um, is around an end-to-end -end solution with people that you work with. So we'll talk about what is a theory of change and what should be your impact framework today and cover off some ideas around that. We'll talk about how then you manage processes with your clients and how do you collect data throughout that. We'll then look at systems um, and you know how you then analyze that data and evaluate performance. So we won't be obviously going in detail in all of these things within an hour but what we want to do is give you a flavor of, of things that are important. So the first step is about defining framework. So we'll first look at beneficiaries and think about what information you track um, about your beneficiaries. So the starting point is, is to think about the diagnostic. And I'm a big believer in, you know, you want to understand what the beneficiaries' needs and goals are on a personal level. Okay, they want a job, you know, they might be unemployed and getting a job, but what job do they want to do? You know, what type of job, what industry, um, you know, what are their other barriers they're facing? And it really is about unpacking what's important to the person um, and taking them through a series of where you track then the assessment information. So you might do baseline assessment and then a continued assessment of where they're at six months or at the end of the program and 
tracking the distance travelled. Um, you might look at the support plan, create a support or action plan for them, and you know specify the goals within that. You would then look at tracking the intervention for people, so whether that's face to face, um, you know, telephone support, email support, you know, tracking all of that and logging how many hours support that you're doing. Um, it's about communication, you know, what communication you're having with people and what indeed are their preferred communication channels. Um, that's increasingly important when it comes to data protection and, and communication methods these days. You'd probably look at tracking what type of outcomes you're achieving with these beneficiaries, where they're referred in from to and where you're referring them out to, so tracking all of that referral information um, and then also asking people for feedback, you know, how, they, how have they found the service, has it met their expectations. These are all the types of things that we work with, with clients on a daily basis to kind of bottom out, like how do we track this information, how do we make it consistent, how do we analyse it, how do we keep it all in one place. How do we get an idea that if we looked at Joe, we'd know Joe's information in all of these areas? That's really, you know, the end goal is have to have one point of a, a true system that collects all of this data, and so you know what you know your beneficiary is really about and what interaction they've had with your organisation. So. We wanted to share with you some of the types of data you might collect at these different levels, um, which can start your thought process. Um, and indeed, we'll, we'll take this to the sort of a next level in a moment. But you might track for baseline information, origin of lead, source of referral, reason for referral, all of their demographic data. Um, you might want to track whether they're in deprived areas. You might want to look at socioeconomic status at the start. You might want to look at their personal goals, and you might want to look at the baseline assessment need. Now, why is this important, and how does it link in with strategy? Well, if you really understand who your beneficiaries are and what they need, it will help you apply for those types of funding or contracts that's around innovative service delivery. So maybe people are coming to you because they've got the service. You know, you already have that service, or maybe they're come to you and you go well actually they need this but we don't do it so actually we've had you know we've had 30 40 people that need this and obviously it doesn't exist in the local market because they're coming to us um, and maybe we can then sort of put in some funding to develop something so if you really understand your client base understand what their needs are one you can make sure that you can properly advise them and you know we talk a lot about information advice and guidance for young people and the matrix mark is the key kite mark that is around making sure that you provide proper advice and guidance for young people and the main outcome of that mark is that you sit down with somebody and you do a diagnostic and based on what they tell you you can you know, make that decision about whether they are right for their service or not. If they are, then obviously you bring them into your service. It might be that they aren't right for your service and you need to demonstrate that you are referring them on elsewhere, which is seen as a positive outcome and you, that you track that information and show that you have actively supported them and signposted them to another provider. And the third element is, as I say, is it might be that you can't signpost them because maybe nobody's doing that, but what it does is give you evidence to say there's a gap in the market here, we need to get some funding and provide this service because it isn't here right now. So baseline information and gathering it will help you to really either build partnerships with other organisations, help you think about your future strategy, but also consolidate that actually what you're delivering is based on a real need and that you know people are coming to your service and have been supported properly. And as I say, that can help you achieve your kite marks, such as matrix kite mark. So that's all around the baseline data and really what that can help you achieve. In terms of outputs and intervention, um, you know, tracking all of the hours of support that you're delivering. You know, an email can take five minutes or a text message, and those sorts of little bits of time can be missed. So what we really encourage in a system, you know, a client relationship management system, is that all of that support is logged, whether it's five minutes, ten minutes, an hour, or three hours of training, that you've got this one place that is a true record of all the amount of hours of support that you're providing providing somebody. And now that might be delivered by your internal staff and it might be developed about it might be delivered, sorry, by your volunteers, and all of that information needs to be captured. Now, if you have this information captured, captured within a CRM system, you can start to then automatically calculate the costs of that support. So based on your team member, whether that is a volunteer or an internal staff member, you can approximate, okay, well, we know that, you know, Sam, our internal advisor, 
her cost is this, her unit cost is this per hour, and we know for a volunteer that we can calculate an in-kind value for their time, which might be, you know, equivalent of £30 per hour. Um, and so what you can start to do is automatically calculate the amount of time and cost that a beneficiary is, is, is being given, which can help you with future funding bids, because you can say at the end of the year that we have, um, you know, had three you know three thousand pounds worth of in-kind support from volunteers this year and then you can look at a granular level and go we know joe who's a beneficiary had um you know three hundred pounds worth of in-kind support or you know it might be about true cost and this is very important like a lot of funders um, and certainly commissioners are looking and wanting to understand what is the cost price point of your delivery because they are saying you know we will only give you three thousand pounds to help you get somebody into employment so how much is it costing you to get that person to employment so all of this you know tracking outputs and intervention and tracking the costs is really valuable and again that's something I'd really encourage you to tighten up today if it's not something that you've got you know figured out already in terms of attainment rates, level of engagements, partners and referrals, as that sort of elicited in the first stage of this round baseline data, you know, tracking who you're working with, who helps you get these outcomes will help you think about robust partnerships for the future. Now, when you go for, again for commissioning or for funding, you know, showing that you've got a really good working relationship, you've got past track record of working with different organizations, you can evidence outcomes of those working relationships um, is really powerful so if you have a system and you properly have processes in place to track your signposting and what have been the outcomes of that that really will help consolidate um, and give you evidence to show that you have robust working relationships that you've achieved these outcomes working in partnership and will give you a you know a, that that sort of really um, good evidence that will stand you apart from perhaps other competitors. Um, you know, understanding the attainment rates and level of engagement of your beneficiaries is equally important because you need to know how many starts you had on a program and whether they sustained the outcomes at the end of the program, that they actually completed the program, and actually what they sustained six months after. So all of this sort of information can be really valuable, and that really leads us on to outcomes. So. You know, you've got distance travelled assessments. We talked about you know tracking the start assessment at the end point, all of those sorts of information. You can track soft and hard outcomes. You know, have they? Again, I find it really important um, that you know a funder might typically say, well, how many people did you get into a job? Well, okay, well we got 300 people into a job, but to get something to a job is normally a long, you know, a, a medium or long term outcome. The short term outcomes are about building people's um, confidence, giving them more knowledge about IT, for example, or you know, helping them with a CV. There's a lot of soft outcomes um, and short-term outcomes that you might develop and deliver to somebody that you should track within a system. And that really does show a journey that you know, it helps you show the journey of travel and, and what somebody's achieved with you to help them get that employment outcome. And I'm a great believer in giving a funder more information about the outcomes that they've achieved beyond what they ask you. So if they're asking about well, how many people got into jobs, give them obviously that data, but give them more data about well, what were the outcomes and steps that you had to achieve to get there, you know, how much did it cost you, how many hours of support did somebody need, what were the steps that somebody had to go through and how long did it take um, and you can start to put then a value of outcomes achieved so you might sort of track, you know, well we can say well it's, you know, it's cost us £2,000 to get to help somebody achieve this outcome, um, you know, and if it's helping them with a CV, then maybe that's about hundred pounds, or you know, the overall arching um, set of short-term outcomes that help them get that job maybe amounts to two thousand. But if you have all of this in a system, you can start to evidence that you can start to prove it if somebody says well what are these figures based on you've got that evidence there and this particularly came relevant like if any of you are looking at social impact bond um, type arrangements um, there's currently one that's out there at the moment that you can look at for youth um, but we were part of a facilitated um, a particular consortium for the youth engagement fund um, and this was so important like all of the partners within that consortium needed to price point, they needed all of the evidence that I've talked about here to prove that they could achieve um, the outcomes because with a social impact bond arrangement what you're doing is saying to a social investor believe in me, believe in me that you'll invest that money, that you'll confidently you know, 
invest six thousand, you know, six hundred thousand pounds with a view that we are going to achieve these outcomes. So you need really hard evidence that one, you know that your costs are very real, that you know your outcomes are very real, and that you can achieve these sorts of outcomes. So this is, you know, if you're working with young people, this is all the type of information that you want to do. And if you have this evidence, what you can achieve, the end point here is about a comparative benchmark, because funders and commissioners will look at your price points um, and what you've achieved, like, you know, it's cost you £3,000 or £2,000 to get somebody into a job and you've got 50 people into a job, they are going to benchmark your application and your figures against other providers to see how competitive you are. And so it's very important to know know this data but also to to have an understanding about how you sit in the marketplace. So that's the, the you know the, the work about beneficiaries. And um, we very much encourage you to think about your impact, you know, what is it you want to achieve with young people that's around your mission or around obviously all the other stakeholders are involved, like funders, like you're going to have a set of outcomes that you track that are important to you. But if you want to attach yourself to existing frameworks out there, these are some of the youth outcome frameworks that you might want to look at. And I wouldn't say, as I say, think about what's important to you first, don't just go and attach yourself to one, because I think it's important that these add value to what you do rather than be the only thing that you track. I'm a big believer of having a, a theory of change that is organisational driven and that these things, as I say, add value to it. So you can look at Project Oracle, you can look at the JET framework, you can look at the Youth Outcomes framework, you can look at Outcome Scar, um, Outcome Stars, and the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Health um, Wellbeing Scale. So these are all ones that have our clients have used, and we've helped them set up systems to capture and analyse all this data real time. So that's where we're going to talk about getting to. Is you know obviously we work with one system, but if you have a system in place and you can track all of this information to a system, that's really what we're encouraging you to think about today. So there's some examples around youth support. Now in terms of volunteering, which is the other area that we're particularly looking at today, um, you'll start to collect data around um, and manage around recruitment, you'll do quality checks, you'll want to track what training you're giving to volunteers, you'll go through a process of wanting to match the right volunteers to the right young people, um, you'll want to track the support and recognise the work of the, the volunteers and you'll also want to capture the feedback from the volunteers and understand you know, how they've found the whole experience of the support they've been given by your organisation but also their work with young people. So these are the types of, of functions that a volunteer manager will quite often have to do. Now in terms of what to track here, again we've got a similar sort of layout to what we looked at for beneficiaries. So in terms of recruitment of volunteers, you might want to track, have specific indicators that help you to analyse number of applications, number of interviews, number of training hours you've done, you know, what to work out the average length of the recruitment process. Um, it can be obviously useful to know the number of active volunteers you've got, what their background is, you know, what is their motivations for um, what are their motivations for volunteers, what's their goals and interests, um, and are they a first-time volunteer? So this is all the information that we um, specifically focus on and help people collect around um, recruitment of volunteers. So it's something that I would really sort of knuckle down on. Um, then in terms of outputs of volunteers, you can look at number of hours of support given by volunteers, um, number of volunteer hours, um, number of active volunteers, number of beneficiaries supported by volunteers, average number of beneficiaries supported by, by volunteers, um, the in-kind value of volunteer time and the average retention rate. Um, so again, you know, a range of outputs. And when we talk about outputs, Outputs for those that are perhaps not as familiar with the uh, the differences between outputs and outcomes. Outputs is about the scale of intervention. It's not about any change that you're making. It's about the scale of your delivery. So if you had a business plan or a project plan, you'd be saying, right, well we're you know we're recruiting this many volunteers. Um, this is how many volunteer hours that we need to be delivered. This is the many different locations. You know, it's not about claiming any change. It's just about the scale of intervention. Now, in terms of outcomes of volunteers, you might look at the personal satisfaction of volunteers, whether the volunteers achieved any new skills or qualifications, whether there was a change in attitude, um, you know, or beliefs, whether they had improved health and well-being, whether they've achieved pro career progression, um, and whether they progressed into eat. Now. 
completely appreciate if you're working with young people, you might not track the outcomes for volunteers, and, and that's fine. You might just, you know, track the output information. Um, but if you're wanting to show that volunteers have gained things as a result of being involved in um, the volunteering experience, that these are some of the outcomes that you might want to track. And what I've put together, again, is a... Um, a, a list in a moment, sorry I've got this slide first, um, but a list of resources that you can go to again where you can look at existing volunteer outcome frameworks um, and there's various different ones out there for different things, so you've got ones for criminal justice, you've got ones for corporate volunteers, you've got ones for volunteers engaged in the community, you've got mentoring frameworks, you've got volunteering in developing countries framework, you've got one around youth volunteering and social action which is specifically focused on young people who are volunteers, and then you've got volunteers in the arts. Um, and then if you're involved in helping volunteers become, um, you know, to improve their health and well-being, you can look at the national measures and national well-being. And the NCVO volunteer toolkit is a little bit wider than, you know, it covers pretty much a whole range of volunteering opportunities. So there's different ones there to look at. Just sorry, jumping back to this slide, um, the wider outcomes um, of, of volunteering, and I think, you know, again, this really feeds into your strategy, is I believe, you know, can you track the organisational growth that is attributable to your volunteers? So for some organisations, an organisation simply could not run and deliver what it does without volunteers. Um, for me, the Prince's Trust is a pretty good example. So we evaluated all of their enterprising programmes and their enterprising programmes that they deliver in schools, that they deliver to um, unemployed young people um, and to those young entrepreneurs that are becoming ambassadors. And we evaluated their programme with a view to helping them figure out what the key outcomes were. Um, now, what is pretty relevant there is that you know it, it, it pretty much showed that their volunteers are invaluable, um, and without volunteers, they couldn't increase. You know, it, they need volunteers to continue to increase the, the support they give beneficiaries. Um, it helps them scale up their services, like you know they, that is their main um, delivery mechanism. Um, and if they continue to track the value of these volunteers, like particularly if a lot of them are corporate volunteers, you know, that corporate volunteers hourly rate could be something like, you know, I don't know if they're a lawyer, I don't know, I don't know many lawyers, but you know, maybe £300 an hour, like that's the equivalent value that perhaps they're getting. So it's worth thinking about what value you are certain to volunteers um, and that can help you with match funding. So this can really be a powerful ingredient to your business strategy um, but also your fundraising strategy. Now in terms of the, um, you know, if you commonly use volunteers then they really do um, have a positive kind of relationship with your beneficiaries. If they, if a beneficiary did not have a good experience with a, um, a volunteer, it can really undermine the, the, the value of your program. So it's important as an organisation that you have a feedback process where you get independent feedback from the young person, you get independent feedback about the mentor or the volunteer, and you're certain whether there was a positive experience, whether there's any learning from that, whether the volunteer indeed had more support or guidance. Um, and this can, you know, understanding the whole experience will help you understand, you know, why there's perhaps been a really good retention rate or a really low retention rate. It might help you also track whether there's been, you know, good peer referrals because if a, if a young person's had a great experience, they're likely to refer other people. So if you can evaluate where all your referrals have come from and, you know, in particular whether young people are referring others because of the experience, that really is a powerful statement and powerful evidence to be able to share with prospective funders and commissioners. Um, and so it really does sort of inform your marketing and engagement strategy and help you think about the value of your volunteers in that way. Um, I think the other thing is also to, um, as I mentioned before, look at the positive outcomes um, that relate to the volunteers. So, um, you know, again, has a, a volunteer helped the beneficiary achieve their goals? Um, have they achieved outcomes? You know, and also what connections a volunteer provides? Because I think, you know, again, this sort of sits outside the fence that if you have a volunteer quite often through their network, they might help that person get a job. And it's all of this additional information that you can collect to say, well, you know, who got them that job and how 
you know, how valuable are these volunteers being? Okay, beyond the one hour of support that these volunteers are actually bringing all these connections, and that's how somebody got a job. So if you can sort of say, well, you know, we've helped 300 people get jobs, and actually through the connections of the volunteers, um, you know, we've helped that's helped at least 200 of them get these jobs and that's a really powerful message and really does sort of again sort of um, provide um, additional experience um, and evidence to funders so these are all the sorts of things you can track that can again inform your strategy for the future now going on to define processes I'm going to hand over to Sarah at this point to talk about um, the processes so let me just give her right and unmute her Sarah, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Heather. Um, so first of all, when we're starting to look at client tracking, um, we really need to plan out what is the journey for that volunteer. Um, here on this slide, we can see the registration aspect at the beginning. Um, again, going back to what are their needs, why are they, why are they registering, understanding why they want to volunteer, um, if there's Fair a support point. plan to happen. So this slide's talking about client beneficiaries, not volunteers, sorry. Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, and the registration of them, but even still, um, why the clients want to actually be registered. Um, then going through to the assessments, and so having a baseline survey, sending out at the beginning to actually realize where we're starting at in terms of the clients, um, will allow us to then send three months, six months, nine months surveys following up, and really allow us to start to build out how um, how are our clients improving over t over time, um, with the final survey at at the end. This really allows us to um, manage what impact um, is actually being made and created through the time, so that you can actually see um, in a system that there is actual improvement. Or if there is an improvement, um, and this I'm sure some people are aware on the webinar call, could actually be because you're making them more aware um, of what aspects um, actually needed improvement or work. Um, so obviously sometimes a negative um, result in terms of the three month, six month, nine month assessments based on the baseline doesn't necessarily mean that the projects aren't working, but could mean that they're becoming more aware of the work that actually needs to happen. Um, then in terms of the support, um, how are you going to um, to track that support? Is it is it training? Is it one to one? Is it group, telephone, emails? Um, for instance, in terms of um, one of the organizations I was working in recently, um, Visionary, they support um, other organizations and they track all of the different types of support that they're doing so that they can see how it builds up over time, that it's not just perhaps a set meeting, but it's also a series of phone calls and emails that build towards this capacity building um, that you're doing. And then by going through that and tracking both the assessments, which is more the um, actually how they're feeling that it's changing over time, to the actual outputs, the support, what work is going in, we can then track the outcomes, so the hard outcomes that are then achieved at the end, and we can see how this is going through time in order to track that. Any further information to add on this slide, Heather? No, don't think so. Absolutely. So the next slide shows us the volunteer tracking, which is the one I started talking about earlier. Um, so volunteer tracking, again, I've always found it useful to sit down at the beginning um, and actually map out just on a piece of paper what is the journey, find out what those pain points for the volunteers are, um, what are the points where you drop the most people. Um, your marketing team or um, your applications recruitment team might have some figures on this. If you lose 20% um, of your volunteers at the recruitment stage, that's the stage you need to focus on. If you lose 50% during actually the support stage, that's the stage you need to focus on. So it's really good to map out at the beginning all of these stages. So starting with 
recruitment is the initial application stage. So how are we going to actually get people to apply to be a volunteer with us? How are we going to ensure that it's easy and straightforward but still gives us the information that we need to be able to onboard them? And so what information do we need to be able to actually get them started? Are there any DBS checks? Um, if so, how easy can we make that? Can we do online DBS checks for the references? Um, at what point in the volunteer tracking journey should we start sending them out? Um, the induction training, what, when can we um, do those? What needs to be done in order to get this volunteer actually um, starting doing support work? Then for the allocation, it's all about um, how are we going to allocate them based on their availability, based on their actual wants and needs as well. So one way to, to ensure that we're retaining our volunteers is to actually listen to what they're interested in and try and not only um, use our volunteers to actually support um, clients and to actually do valuable, impactful work, but to also give them something back in terms of helping them um, work on the kind of volunteering that they're interested in and want to do. Um, so there's various apps out there. Um, in Salesforce in the past, I've used the Volunteer app, um, which is a free app which has a Find a Volunteer ability, whereby you can search for volunteers based on their availability and skills that they've said, and then match them um, to places that you know that need volunteers. Again, that's trying to automate that aspect. So you're ensuring that you're listening to their needs, you're matching them to, to, to the correct availability, but you're doing it quickly and efficiently. And then it's also then tracking those deliverables, so moving over to the support to volunteers. Um, <clears throat> have you got any events that you can run to actually make them grow as volunteers and then tracking whether or not they attend those, those events. Are you doing regular supervisions with your volunteers to ensure that they feel that they're being supported, that they're not just on the front line by themselves, that they have this, this office, this team backing them up? Or can, if you don't have enough time for the supervisions yourself, can you set up an online peer support community? Um, so that could be a cloud community whereby they can log in and talk to other volunteers, share best practice, um, actually share tips, and feel like they have that support network um, to help them. That can be a really low cost, um, low effort way of giving that peer support to people. Can you ask previous volunteers to act as alumni and ambassadors and actually working and supporting um, future people? Um, we, uh, um, I've done that before in terms of at Teach First. Um, when I volunteered on the Futures program, um, we had mentors of people who had actually volunteered before um, and they would give us guidance and, and help on how um, how you know to go about in terms of the volunteering, what's worked for them previously, um, what hasn't worked. So that not only gives the support to the volunteers and helps retention, but it also helps ensure that the quality of the volunteering that these new volunteers are giving um, benefits from previous um, issues that other volunteers have had. So you're learning from, from past um, situations and building on that and ensuring that there's a higher quality of work going forward. Um, and then in terms of qualifications as well, can you tie this volunteering to a qualification, in which case you will help with retention um, and you'll also ensure that you're having happier volunteers and volunteers are actually benefiting something they can see going forward. Um, for International Citizen Service, uh, we actually started a qualification linked to the volunteering that you could do additional work, additional coursework in addition to your 12-week volunteer placement um, and combined with that you could actually end up with a qualification at the end of that. That really helped um, engage another sector 
of possible volunteers that otherwise wouldn't apply, um, people that, that really want to have something in addition on their CV, other than just saying they're volunteering, if they can actually say on their CV, I volunteered for 12 weeks and this is the qualification that I gained at the end of it, that really gives more value um, to the experience and the time that they've, they've given up um, to your organisation. And in correspondence, um, I can't stress enough how vital um, tracking the correspondence can be, especially if multiple staff are working with the same volunteers. If you're tracking all the correspondence, then at any point if there's miscommunications um, about <coughs> If there's any miscommunication about what they have and haven't heard, you can just have a look at the list of activities and phone calls and emails that various people have sent and get to the bottom of that straight away. So it really helps with transparency um, and it really helps ensure you deliver a connected support service to those volunteers that you don't ring them um, the day after a bad um, incident has happened to them asking them why they didn't attend an event because you've looked at the correspondence list, the activity list and you've seen that a previous um, staff member has already talked to them and understands that they're going through a certain rough time. Then the outcomes again linked slightly to the qualifications here but what achievements um, how have they have they done what feedback um, are they giving? Really good here for online forms that can feed into your CRM system for them to actually tell you um, what went well, what didn't go well. But the important part here is to actually then follow up on that feedback. So if they say that the recruitment process is too laborious and too long, then don't just ignore that feedback, take it on board, go back to the recruitment application forms and see if there's anything that you can do to make that easier. Um, then following with the progression, is there um, any progression for your volunteers? It's always good to stress um, any good news stories as well about volunteers that go on to become staff members. Um, I know that um, at International Citizen Service, nearly all of the, the teams by, by the end um, of my time working there were all previous volunteers. They'd all gone on the volunteer program and gone on to work for the charities that they volunteered with. Um, that really shows um, progression for the volunteers and gives um, some, some aim and, and, and shows that there's further benefits possible from volunteering but also share with them some possibilities um, and ways that they can progress into either more advanced volunteering um, or training or even helping with jobs. It could be that you follow up with a alumni event where you give them advice on CV writing. How can they take this volunteering and explain it in a more accurate and, and vital way on their CVs to put across to future employees the great, um, the great volunteering and the great achievements that they made during this volunteering time. Again, we can then hopefully track that all on our reports and dashboards, so we can not only see the impact that the volunteers have made, but also um, the feedback that they're making and the progression that they're and what are they going in to do? Um, have they gone on to get full-time employment afterwards? When they stop volunteering, that's not the end. It can just be the beginning of the journey with, um, with a not-for-profit. If you continue to have a relationship with your, with your alumni, then eventually you cultivate this relationship and they feel an ownership um, to your organization, they're more likely to donate in the future, they're more likely to recommend your organization to other people and they become an ambassador for you. So it's really good to keep cultivating that relationship even once they've stopped volunteering. So if we go to the next slide now, 
so we can see some of the data capture tools which Heather will show us in the next slide. So some of the aspects we were talking about in the previous slides is really about making it as easy as possible for our volunteers and different points of data collection, different communication methods can really help with that. There's different online forms. Um, form assembly is a tool that I've used before at, um, at Teach First. Um, it works really well. You can send automated um, emails with links to forms to gather further information at certain points in the volunteer journey. Um, offline forms, uh, there's certain tools um, whereby people, can, if they don't have internet access, can still fill in forms that can still go into CRMs, um, especially useful if you're working in an international development organization where they don't always have internet. Um, CRM access, actually, rather than just gathering the information from your volunteers, why don't you give them some access to an online community? If they have access to the online community, they can take ownership of some of their data, they can log the volunteering hours that they're doing, um, and it cuts down on your internal administration time completely. So communities are a really great way of not only cutting down on administration, but retaining volunteers, as you can then start to advertise um, job opportunities, um, opportunities to talk to specific organizations, alumni possibilities um, that wouldn't be available unless they log into your community and do specific work in your community. Um, mobile tablet is vital as we all know in today's world. Your, your application form, your recruitment, um, different data collection methods and your feedback forms all have to be mobile adaptable. <clears throat> the percentage of users nowadays using their mobile um, to, to do almost everything in terms of applications, applying, tracking, um, is too high to ignore. I know that whenever I apply for volunteering, I always access it through my mobile phone. And if it doesn't work, if it's um, not adaptable, then people are going to get frustrated with that form and you're going to have an abandoned application form. Um, website access, so again, is there specific um, forms on your website for them to quickly say if they need help or if there's any feedback? That then links into the web chat. Can you um, have specific times of the day, perhaps once a week, um, for someone to be online to have a web chat and answer any questions. This worked really well um, at International Citizen Service for our applications team. We started setting up um, around about once a month, we'd have a web chat whereby we'd have um, a previous volunteer, a staff member and a member of the communications team to log in um, and to be there from 6 to 8 p.m. to answer any questions from any volunteers. And it really cut down that process of them sending us a message, us finding the message, sending back the reply, then then capturing it, taking place over a few days. It's instant um, gratification for our, for our possible volunteers. They instantly get their questions answered. They instantly have a real pet live person to talk to. Um, and it can really bring alive the volunteering if you also have an alumni um, at present to actually explain their experiences. And then social media, there's various um, apps that can now connect to Facebook, Twitter and so forth um, to CRMs so that you can actually have people being able to post um, into social media when they are volunteering um, or even uh, showing interest in volunteering from Facebook ads. So again, it's about making it as easy as possible, finding out where are your volunteers spending most of their time online and making sure your ads are there. So if we look at the next slide,
So some tips for engaging our volunteers. So to the right, um, this is a screen grab of something called a process builder. So I know a few of the people on the call today are currently using Salesforce. Um, Salesforce has a type of automation called process builder whereby you can kind of map out in the same way you would um, a process flow, a process chart, at what stages um, do certain things happen and then at what actions can be sent out at those stages. So in terms of engaging um, our volunteers, we really want to make it as easy as possible. We want to ensure it's mobile adaptable. If possible, we want them to be able to apply direct from social media where they're spending more of their time. But we also want to break up the application form um, into shorter parts and try and automate the sending of the next parts as they submit previous parts. So one thing that puts, up, puts off a lot of particularly young volunteers is actually the length of application forms and the amount of information they need to fill in before they even talk to a real life person. If you can have an initial um, interest application form whereby you say I'm interested in applying, this is my name, this is my email address, this is my phone number, you're allowed to contact me. Once you've got that from them, then you can help them through the application process and you can give them tips and you can give them support um, and you can send through Process Builder, which we have in this screen here. When they fill that in, you can automatically get Salesforce to send a follow-up form, say five days later, whereby it then asks them for references or if they don't fill in the initial form, still capture information but then send them a reminder um, one week later that they have an incomplete application form. By doing this, you're, you're ensuring that they don't forget about the application form. You're ensuring that it's easier to do and because it's only short parts that they have to fill in at certain times, it's really easy to fill in from a mobile phone in just five minutes during one of their breaks rather than something they need to necessarily sit down for two hours and fill out in one go. It also means that if you're targeting um, perhaps volunteers um, not in um, employment, education or training, that you're, you're ensuring that it's easy to apply and that if they need support with the application form, that you can call them and actually talk them through the application form and give them a different way of filling it in um, if they, they don't feel confident um, filling in an application form themselves online. Brilliant. Again, that goes down to the offering the form in multiple formats. Um, do offer the possibility of filling in the form together online or do um, offer um, Braille application forms. Do, do offer um, different ways um, to ensure that your volunteers are as, as widespread and diverse as possible as that will ensure your projects uh, um, as successful as possible as you're gathering different um, expertise and a different um, spread of volunteers that will have different experiences that they can all bring to your projects. So if we go to the next slide now, we can talk about communication. So it all leads on, which is have it short but sweet. So you can see on our slide um, to the right, we have a possible email template. So Salesforce allow you to do um, email templates called newsletter templates. And so newsletter templates allow you to actually break up um, the, the page into sections. Most people don't read past the first line of an email. It's unfortunate, but true. If you have the most vitally important information at the top, you're ensuring that even if they don't read the entire email, they have the information they need to actually be successful, to actually still achieve the outcome from that communication. Then, if you have any further information that is still important that you want to use to engage them to get them excited, you can have it in blocks underneath as if it was a newsletter. 
So in this example, we've given them the information they need to get through to the next stage of the volunteer recruitment journey. But then in the bottom boxes, we've given them information on what they need to bring. And to the right, we've given them some facts about the volunteering program. This means that they really, um, if you have someone who's very eager and engaged and wants to look up various other parts, you could perhaps include some links to some volunteering videos, to some articles, um, to different things that can keep them happy and engaged and, and really um, motivated about the volunteering. But if you have a volunteer that just wants, you know, doesn't have much time, just wants the information, they have that at the top. If they don't read the bottom, it's not the end of the world. You will be able to follow up with a phone call and perhaps gather that information at a later date. So time it well. Do make sure that you're sending emails and texts, um, not at 5 p.m., on a Friday night, no one will read it, um, and don't send it at 8 a.m. <laughs> on the morning. Um, again, no one will read it. If you try and send an email when people are actually looking at their emails, when people are actually, you know, going through, um, perhaps on their break, you know, they want a little break, they want to see their emails, send them then. So that could be lunchtime if most of your um, your volunteers are actually currently in employment. It could be 4 p.m. if it's quite young volunteers, um, so it could be after lectures, um, so if, try and get it to 4 p.m. just while they're getting ready to go out. They might be checking their emails, but don't send it any later when they're already out. And also then send automate, uh, automatic reminders. So once you've told them about certain aspects, make sure that you're sending them an email or a text one day before anything that they need to go to to ensure that they're reminded that it's happening and if in doubt text um, i can't stress the importance of using text as a communication method enough if you text them even if they don't read a text most people's phones will still beep and show them what the text is about so even if they don't open it they will see that you've texted them. They will see the first line of the text so they know that it's important. Brilliant. So if we go through to the next slide next, it's all about managing um, volunteers as well. So I mentioned a few of these examples here, but creating an alumni network and creating a community can really ensure that you keep your volunteers engaged that you keep possibly your clients engaged as well as they can also have a community and that you're ensuring that you're keeping retention as um, as good as possible so to the right we can see an example of a Salesforce community more client basing um, but it allows them a place where they can log in where they can actually ask questions and actually see documents that will help them with their projects. So you can create a similar community for volunteers um, whereby any information that will support them is in here and they can talk to each other using perhaps um, chatter or another communication method to actually support each other and to share those best practice and ideas. Also make sure that you're offering a preference centre, so rather than just assuming that people need to um, email, ensure that you're saying would you like to be emailed, text, phone called, is there a particular time of the day that it's better to communicate with you and so forth. By gathering those preferences and actually having them in a CRM, it means every time you need to communicate with that volunteer, you know what method they prefer and you know what time it's best to contact them so that you can manage that relationship with the volunteer better. We also have list views in Kanbans as a good way of actually tracking your volunteers and tracking your volunteer projects and being able to see in one shot actually how many of our volunteers are still at the beginning of the volunteer journey, how many at the end, and actually just being able to have that visual representation and dragging them through those stages. Linked to that, once we have volunteer stages, we can start to automate processes, yes, but it is still important to keep that human touch too. 
It's knowing a short phone call can deal with a lot of issues in one go. Yes, it might take time, but it means that they feel like you, they're appreciated. They feel like you do care for each, um, for each individual volunteer. Um, and it can give them a chance to, to feedback and explain what they're happy with and what they're not happy with. So if we go through to the next slide now, brilliant. So now we're going to have a look at system analysis, so I'll be handing back over to Heather. But if there are any questions about any of the slides that I explained earlier, um, we'll be able to take any questions at the end. Thank you, Heather. Great, thanks Sarah. Lovely. So really um, what we go through now is just really a sum up of what Sarah has, has mentioned and obviously some of the bits that I've pulled out around impact measurement and delivery. So um, you know, where we encourage clients to get to in terms of best practice of system and data analysis is, you know, if we do a sum up of, of the key points so far is, um, you know, know your data. If you know your data and you can analyse it well, you can use that to inform your future strategy around your organization, your services, and help you win new funding commissions. So having a, a one system that collects all of the data points that we've mentioned today is really important to help shape everything. Secondly, refine your processes, think through them properly, um, you know, where does it need the personal touch? Where can you use automation? Understand the time frames. So, you know, again, we encourage lean management processes. You know, think about how long a process takes you now. Go through that process and see if you can make it much more efficient through automation or simply through, you know, internal coordination. Um, and set that up and use a system to help, you know, manage that and also um, analyze how long something is taking and how much it's costing you because again that will shape your future strategy in terms of financials um, resourcing um, and help you cost out your um, your services much more better so having a system that does data analysis across impact financial um, marketing communication will allow you to you know one, have better client relationships, will improve team visit visibility, sorry, and give you that real-time analytics to know what is going on in your organization to inform your strategy going forward. And indeed, there's an element around improved security of data these days, and you need to think about strategy for your IT um, and your data in line with Data Protection Act and fundraising regulation, if that's applicable. So look towards getting a CRM if you haven't got one already. I know certainly some online do have that. Um, and, you know, set up dashboards that give you data um, for all of your, you know, this is an example dashboard showing you various charts. This is specific to feedback, but you could have one set up around, you know, your financials, again, your marketing engagement, like referral channels, um, you know, find out what delivery is happening, find out what people's feedback is and respond on that. So we're a big advocate of having a continual improvement process where you review your data regularly whether that's on a weekly basis at meetings monthly basis or quarterly and acting on that feedback to shape the way you change and if you can promote that to your um, again your future funders partners or commissioners they'll see that you're an organization that takes change and improvement seriously and that you act upon that learning and we find that if you show these types of dashboards to those funders and commissioners they'll bite your arm off they love seeing this and if you can give them access to these dashboards they'll love it even more because they can see what's going on real time on your projects um, and that has been a really powerful sell for some of our clients so dashboard tips as I mentioned at the beginning, have a high level outcome framework for your organization. Make sure that you have a theory of change for your organization and that each of your projects and services feeds into that. So you can narrow your data down on a contract level, so you can look at what the big lottery is funded, for example, and what's happened on that program. But if you take that filter out, you can see it at an organizational level. Um, again, you can set filters on your dashboards by demographics or geography if you're a national organization. Um, you can analyze your data more thoroughly using formulas to really sort of calculate changes within reports. Um, 
we've mentioned around um, looking and evaluating team performance and that could be about seeing which volunteers are really performing really well what secret ingredients have they got that actually perhaps we could share with other volunteers so is it that a volunteer has achieved you know great outcomes with young people over the last five years um, and you could share their learning and their approach um, you know perhaps with new volunteers coming on board so you know evaluating team performance shouldn't be seen as a negative thing but actually looking at the granular level and seeing which team members which advisors which volunteers are really um, you know achieving well for you can perhaps help share that learning um, track average um, you know incline costs of interventions um, and set up charts so you can look at comparative benchmarks across your different teams nationally perhaps um, and see again where where different areas are performing and sort of start to work out why so there's some of the dashboard tips that we'd really encourage now going through some case studies of, of clients that have taken on board um, a lot of this learning that we shared with today uprising um, is one organization that had various um, regional teams and they worked a lot in silos they collected that information at a localized level on spreadsheets analyzed it obviously for reporting from reporting um, purposes um, but didn't have a centralized system and, and didn't really sort of use, they use that contact information their beneficiary information to retain those young people as volunteers and, and ambassadors beyond so they went down the line of, of setting up a system using Salesforce um, and setting up various automated processes and using tools such as online application forms using the system for matching and delivery um, and then providing online forms to volunteers to feedback what their work had been doing with the young people um, and so it really you know start to track all of that learning that we've shared with you today um, and that has really helped them to better analyze their performance at a national level um, and use all of that data centrally when they're applying for future bids um, so it gives them much more of a handle of exactly where they are as an organization and can sort of get real-time analy analytics um, you know on, a, on a, a daily basis so they know how many young people they've got they know how many volunteers they've got they know what those outcomes are and they can also use these young people as volunteers volunteers and alumni in the future and they're actively utilizing those as assets um, to really support their development so um, you know uprising is obviously a great example um, another project we worked on was talent match southeast and we set up this website talent match southeast which is all powered by Salesforce and what this does is actually provide a portal a directory of service providers for young people so it helps a young per person search what support is available to them by region or by type of support and what that does is look into the, the Salesforce instance um, against those criteria and pull out the relevant information and um, has a listing about that support and then provides contact information so the young person can navigate an online directory um, choose the support and, and sort of access it Again, with the Talent Match projects, which were all big lottery funded, they had um, volunteers um, engage with them. So a community was set up. So I've talked about communities. Um, again, you can use various digital tools for communities. Um, Salesforce is obviously one that we use, but you can, you know, use various that might be attached to websites or indeed other databases. Um, and that provides a, a, you know, a secure login to a volunteer where they can log in and see all of you know the relevant information that they're allowed access to about that young person they can see the support plan and action plan and they can log support so they can see both historic and existing new and add new data which is quite distinct to obviously the previous with uprising you know a young a volunteer can feed data in but they can't see what you know they can't see the whole picture because they don't have access to the CRM so it's a different way of doing it with the Shore Trust, similarly, we set up a volunteer community for them, so volunteers can log in. And it's really around rotor management here. So the volunteers are assigned to um, their different you know different types of intervention whether it's in shops schools or working with unemployed people um, and a, a volunteer can set their availability of when they're available and their advisors can then allocate shifts to those volunteers to work with um, you know their beneficiaries and they again use an online form um, using form assembly that Sarah mentioned for volunteer recruitment and application management um, and um, sort of supporting that front-end process 
With trailblazers, they work with ex-offenders, and previously a lot of their correspondence, you know, they worked around emails and telephones and conversations between people. And again, they provided a community for their volunteers to log into, so it meant all correspondence was secure. Um, and again, they did volunteer recruitment using form assembly. So you've got a, a bit of a, a common element. I think what's also relevant to talk about with the Shore Trust and Trailblazers is they set up within the community, they set up a, a chatter community. And this is where the volunteers can connect and support each other. Um, and so you're providing a peer support element for volunteers. So if they were working with somebody and they said, oh, this young person really wants to gain experience as a graphic designer, they could use that and harness that volunteer community and reach out to other volunteers and say, hey, I've got this young person, they're interested in graphic design. Do any of you know of any businesses uh, who our graphic design agencies that could offer young people. So you empower the volunteers to connect and work through those wider set of connections um, and support each other, which you know takes the admin burden, takes that you know limitation through a volunteer only having a point of contact within that organisation with the volunteer coordinator, for example. You empower the volunteers to utilise a much wider network and support community, and that can be really powerful. So that's some of the examples. Now over to sources of funding, which I'm sure a lot of you are always interested in. So um, below I've highlighted some of the funding pots that we are an approved provider of in some cases, so I will highlight those because we, we're not an approved provider for all of them. We can't um, you know, be an approved provider in some cases. Um, but these funding, uh, you know, these sources of funding you know, have funded core infrastructure projects. Um, but it's also worth thinking about that if you want to streamline these processes and systems, um, it's worth thinking about can you build in these costs as operational costs within in any grants in any grants you're applying for for delivery of projects and services. So quite often we'll work with a client where they are, you know, been funded for delivering a service and what they've done is built in um, a cost element for setting up a system and you know setting up processes and an impact evaluation for that project and so you don't need to think about it as just core operational costs um, you know and that you have to look purely at these types of funding pots that I've listed below for that um, but it you know indeed you could build this into delivery costs so the Paul Hamlin Foundation um, you know, we um, we haven't worked directly with them before, but a couple of our clients have um, got funding from them, which is why we highlighted them. So, Ruth, um, I'll hand over to you now to talk about what the Youth Fund does um, and tell them a bit more about that. Thanks, Heather. Um, thanks for having me today. Uh, so, I'll I'll just um, talk a little bit about kind of the, the foundation. So, the Paul Hamlin Foundation. Um, is one of the largest kind of independent uh, foundations, grant making foundations in the UK. Um, and we uh, have an interest in the arts, education, young people, and migration and integration. And that kind of focus on social justice running throughout those kind of core programs. Um, I lead on all our investments in organizations supporting young people. Um, and that was kind of a new area of activity that was highlighted um, in a review that the foundation did in 2014 15. And the reason I mention that is because as part of that that kind of consultation we went out to organizations working with young people and asked them what kind of support they wanted and firmly heard back that core support um, for things like investing in um, in systems and processes and enabling organizations to to be more effective and efficient was one of the things that um, that, that was really difficult to fundraise for um, and so we designed the youth fund um, around that that um, consultation really so our youth fund is is set up for for organizations and provides core funding and there's another um, another fund uh, that, that is aligned to it called the growth fund so I'll just talk about that those two things um, so so the youth fund uh, is for organizations working from 14 to 25s um, in terms of criteria all of this is on the website so I won't go into much, like massive detail but I'll just make, mention the main criteria so organizations working with 14 to 25s um, focused on young people who face challenging transitions um, in terms of transitioning into adult independence so that could be from um, school to work or from not not ed education back into education or from the criminal justice system um, out out of that or from care out of into out of care um, so really kind of that, that challenge that, that period of a young person's life that that is is challenging um, and organizations that are working in a really kind of strengths based way so building on young people's strengths and potential so we're talking we talk about this as an asset based approach but that it can also be called strength based or advantage thinking and there's some more information about that on our website 
Um, but I guess the key thing about the fund, which is um, uh, aligned to the session today, is that we're focusing on organizations who are preparing to grow their impact. So they might be thinking about replication, they might be thinking about widening their reach or, um, or spreading their specific skill or technology, um, uh, or thinking about advancing a particular policy or its implementation or influencing attitudes. And organizations that are um, trying to be potentially more sophisticated or think about how they can grow their impact. So not necessarily the size of their organization or um, the number of people who work for it, but really kind of uh, thinking about scale in terms of the impact and the difference they're making for young people. Um, and I think the, the kind of, uh, as I said at the outset, the, the focus on core funding recognizes that organizations need to achieve stability um, and continuity and flexibility in order to kind of be sustainable um, and to think about how they grow their impact. Um, so uh, so the, the Youth Fund provides funds of um, up to £60,000 over two years um, and gives away £2 million a year. So that's about 30 grants to, to organizations. So that gives you an idea of kind of the scale. It's not massive. Um, and uh, and then the growth fund is kind of the next stage, and so that kind of picks uh, a couple of organisations out of the youth fund pool, um, and and acknowledges that whilst we're supporting organisations to prepare to grow their impact, there's then that point that organisations reach, like Uprising and others that that Heather mentioned, where they've kind of you've refined, um, you know how your volunteering model works, you know how your intervention works, um, and you need that that investment really to realize that growth potential. Um, and so the Growth Fund uh, provides a higher level of support for organizations and also expert support package around that to continue to invest in things like um, uh, experts advice, training, additional expertise, bringing consultancy in, um, particularly around, I guess, systems and data to really uh, continue to to improve. So it, it's kind of that uh, feedback loop, that cycle of, of proving and then improving and constant continuous um, improvement around that. Um, so I think, I mean, I just, uh, well, I'll give a few examples of kind of uh, the type of things that we're supporting. Um, and so, uh, uh, we, we talk about kind of capacity building, but also important to understand that that's about capability building as well. So we're funding things like um, increased capacity in organizations. So allowing a chief executive to to step away from kind of delivery and think about and giving them the headspace maybe to think about investing in systems or or um, looking at their processes and process improvement, um, but also thinking about investing in capability. So building skills, knowledge and confidence um, internally in organizations in order to to allow them to kind of um, uh, invest in their uh, building the organization and developing the organization. Um, so some of the examples of what we're funding around kind of uh, organizations preparing to grow their impact really falls into to three uh, three categories. Um, so there's a lot around kind of financial development and sustainability. So organizations looking to diversify their funding streams, to kind of um, think about self-generated income through uh, social franchising, for example, um, and investing in fundraising. So that's one area. The second area is in organizations looking to further their reach. So expanding to, to reach more young people or a different cohort of young people, or do something in a new way. Um, and then the third way is uh, really what we've been talking about today. So in organizations looking to increase their resource, so around investing in capacity and capability, both externally and internally. And um, and that has meant that we've funded things like people trying to looking to explore the implementation of a Salesforce uh, or a CRM type system, for an example being Salesforce, or um, organizations really focusing on understanding what their program delivers and, and where it adds value. So um, uh, as Heather and Sarah have talked about, understanding exactly what the client intervention looks like or the work with young people, or understanding exactly what um, uh, adds value in terms of volunteering and, and, and both documenting and ensuring that quality and feedback is built into those processes and programs um, and investing in that type of thing and, and really taking some time to, to think about how, do, how, how could we package this our service up in a box, for example, um, and, and give that to somebody else to deliver and what are the what are the qualities and um, and values and uh, secret sauce in that that enables that, that to be so successful. But it really takes some time and investment in things like um, 
uh, a CRM system or understanding what interactions look like or understanding what what um, what is it that makes the difference um, and that does take time and so that's that's kind of what um, the youth fund is set up to, to allow organizations to invest in that so that um, organizations don't continue to do a um, uh, a lot of the same, or if they do, that they know exactly what what is making the difference in that um, in that process. Um, there's a lot more uh, information available on the website, um, so uh, and I'm happy to answer questions as well. But I hope that's given you a taste of kind of the the type of investments that we're offering to organisations supporting young people. Great, thanks, Ruth. That's um, really useful insight. Um, I'll just go through some of the other funds on here then, and, and people can think about any questions they want to ask in the panel, and we can come to those at the end. So, um, just to su sum up some of these other ones here. So, the Access to Impact Management one is a relatively new one. Um, we are working with Eastside Prime Timers, um, so we're sort of in partnership with them, and they are an approved provider. Um, so, if you're looking to become um, contract or social investment ready and you're generally a medium-sized non-profit um, you might want to look at their new grant fund to help you embed systems to help you do impact management more effectively um, similarly with big potential advanced we're an approved provider for, for that fund and that's really focused again on medium-sized non-profits who are aiming to be contract ready or social investment ready um, similarly, um, with the, the Power to Change Community Business Fund, um, this particularly looks at those youth organisations that are community focused and they, you have to be a community business in that you do trade locally, so maybe you have a, 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 like a, an asset that you run, um, like you know, YMCA might have a local centre for example, um, so if you have a community business that generates money within a local community, um, you might well want to look at Power to Change, we're an approved provider for them um, and so if people get a grant then they can use that towards some of the support that we've mentioned today. Um, ones that we're not approved provider for but they um, you know, they will sort of give organisations funding to support the operational costs and then you can choose a provider. Um, the Lloyds Bank Foundation and ABLE Fund exists, it's a relatively smaller one of about I think 15k a year but it's one to look at and it's specifically for sort of smaller charities. Um, the Triangle Trust works with carers, um, you know, is for charities that work with carers or those going through rehabilitation um, and then also the big lottery has various funds for delivery but quite often when you get a big lottery grant you can also apply for a small infrastructure core infrastructure grant so we've had clients that won you know they might have won money for a big lottery program so they've had to get Salesforce in to help them manage that program and all their delivery so that's quite a common um, Know, trait and that it's obviously again helped their organization implement more you know a CRM more widely than just that project however um, but also you can apply for normally I think up to 10k one of our clients has got at the moment which is this core infrastructure grant that they're providing to complement some of their funding streams um, to help sort of build the capacity of an organization more generally so um, you know if you're interested in, in any of these um, you know particularly ones that we provide for then let us know if you're interested in accessing support um, you know or want to sort of learn more about our services around impact measurement or Salesforce systems and what we've been doing with these youth support organizations then do drop me an email and we can have a chat um, if you're in, interested in capacity building um, your skills in-house and this is completely you know system agnostic you know come and find out what it takes to you know implement a CRM find out what the process is learn how to plan internally Think about change management because that's another big area that these funders are, um, you know, want an organisation to embrace because there will be a change involved in changing the way that you do things. Um, and we also run impact measurement workshops. So you can find out more about our different training workshops on this events page. Um, and for those small charities that are interested in, um, Salesforce implementations and particularly we as a social enterprise we're a non-profit ourselves um, but we also train up mums as Salesforce administrators and so we get them working on some of our smaller charity projects um, so we do charge a small fee to help manage that process and make sure that the design and obviously the system is implemented correctly but the mums we train up and then they apply their learning to actually then implement the system so we give a charity up to six free days worth of support on that, um, where the mum sort of thing. So you can find out more about that trainee program and see if you're eligible there. Um, 
I've got some questions coming through now, which is great. So let me just bring in a question for Ruth. Um, so we'll move through to Q&As now. Ruth, it's, um, it says, I noticed on the Paul Hamlin Foundation website that the youth fund can accept applications from organisations with an income over five million. Is this at the time of application or projected income? Um, it, it, it's actually that five million is the kind of top um, the the limit. So over five million, we wouldn't accept. So um, and that would be um, at the time of application. But if I mean, if you're just being pushed over that, so we have had an example of an organisation that's that's taken on a big contract and it's kind of a one off. Um, so give us a call beforehand and we can talk about it if if you're over it. But it's really aimed at because the um, the fund provides core support for organisations. We want to understand that that kind of investment of sixty thousand is going to make a difference. Um, and so. Um, organisations at the top end of that scale, 60,000 within a kind of 5 million turnover isn't necessarily that significant. That's why that's there. Great. Thanks, Ruth. Okay. Any other questions? Anybody? Okay. Any other questions at the time? So, um, just like to say thank you for joining us today. We have finished spot on nearly on time. Um, if there's any other questions now, then happy to answer them. But um, I'd like to say, Ruth, thank you for joining us again. Um, thank you, Sarah, for your contributions as well and from your previous experience. That was all really valuable. Um, and please do give us your feedback, any thoughts, ideas, um, and get in contact with us. Um, so thank you. Thanks for joining again. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.